Welcome to the 925th meeting of the Amateur Telescope Makers of Boston. I'm Tom McDonough, I'm the president, if you don't know me. Welcome. Um, I always ask a question every time. All right, uh, how many birthdays in the month of November? We've got one Scorpio. Any other Scorpios? Wow, this is amazing. One. We've got one over here? Oh, we've got two Scorpios. All right, if you're an Aries, stay away from each other. Okay, not a good match. Am I at the wrong meeting? <laughs> So I'm really excited about the meeting today. Um, JJ Hermes is here today. He's going to give a great presentation. Really looking forward to it. He asked us to save the hardest questions for for after he's done tonight. Or during. Or during. All right. Even even better. So uh, with a little more ado, I want to uh, welcome everybody. Uh, I went to a concert last night. Does anyone know who Hosier is? Yes. All right. Yeah. It was a great concert, but it was amazing. He was up there talking about uh, music, and then he got to talking about Katie Mack. And Katie Mack is a cosmetologist. Cos <laughs> and he started talking about the expansion of the universe and how everything's cooling off, and you know. You're not going to want to be here in billions and billions of years because it's going to really be dark and cold. So if you woke up last night and your foot hurt, or woke up this morning and your foot hurt, and you had a headache or whatever, just appreciate we're here and it's sunny and uh, it's still warm. So, so relatively warm. Relatively warm. Um, and, he, and that was in response to the cold temperatures last night that we were there. Um, We have the observing report with Glenn. So brace yourself. Now, um, and the astronomy magazine, all that money goes towards Glenn for the articles he writes. <laughs> <laughs> That's why they're having so much trouble. They have to edit the articles I send them, and it drives them crazy, and they forget to do everything else. OK. Um, <clears throat> A lot of naked, I think. Uh, Mario's not here, but I'm saving a special moon thing. How many of you noticed the moon coming in today? How beautiful it was? Yeah. Again, what sick person would hate the moon? But Mario's not here, so I'm going to do something to save the next time around. Okay. Some naked eye events happening in the month ahead. Uh, Saturday and Sunday, November 23 to 24. This is after sunset. Venus and Jupiter will be uh, in a conjunction. They'll be lined up together. And I might have mentioned this in before, this is bad. I was playing on an over 40 baseball team up until a few years ago. And uh, I was playing left field and there was a left-handed batter up. So you're supposed to move towards center field. I was shifting the other way because there's a conjunction of Jupiter. <laughs> <laughs> that was also the year that Mars had that great opposition. I'm there looking at Mars and who knows what was happening. Uh, on the, the 28th, you have a double header. In the morning, if you get up before sunrise, Mercury will be at greatest uh, western elongation. And uh, that's a favorable one for us. You still have to have a low horizon to see it, but it's a fairly favorable opposition if you like to get up early in the morning. And then in the evening, after sunset, Jupiter and a thin crescent moon will pair up. It'll be a very nice pair up of those two. It'll be a thin crescent moon. Uh, Friday, November 29th, early in the evening, Saturn will be lined up with a crescent moon, another nice pair up. And again, I've always used these for newbies that don't know how to find the planets. This is a great time. If you want to look for Saturn, if you're a newbie, just look for the moon and that star near it will be the planet Saturn. And then there's a Venus-Saturn conjunction on December 10th, 40 minutes after sunset. So a lot of them low in the sky at those particular times. Uh, the Observer's Challenge for November. I can't tell you much about this because I ain't seen it. But it's a... Uh, Planetary nebula called NGC 246, and I did look for it twice. I had a nice map to find it. All I could see was this wide, well, multiple star, very faint, wide, multiple, which is not easy to know where it's going. I, and I couldn't really see much. It's not there. What's that? Oh, <laughs> you're talking about this. Yeah, there's nothing there. <laughs> there will be, <laughs> but you need a filter, I guess. All I saw was a couple of stars. That little galaxy above, by the way, is not mentioned. It's NGC 255. It's a galaxy about 12th magnitude, so they're in the same field of view. But anyway, uh, 
and I tried averted vision, couldn't see anything. So I thought there was even a mistake with the, the, the chart itself and that there was something wrong. I went inside and then I looked at some pictures and it was. This nebula has a bunch of stars, including the central star in that area. So I went out a few nights later and still didn't have any luck. What I learned about this is you need to have absolute clarity, not just with the sky, because that first thing there's a little bit of haze. The second night was very cold and my eyepiece was fogging up. So you really need a clear and I'd say a dry evening to see this thing. Uh, Rich, you see it. How many here have seen it already? And might as well describe what you saw. Well, those four stars that Glenn was talking about are 11-ish magnitude, maybe almost 12 magnitude. They form a nice little group right there. I and mean, you're right, one of those stars is the central star. The central star of 246 is actually a tertiary system. You know what? We're going to advance the slide because you're talking about that. Let's go to the next okay. a picture of that. We have Mario and Doug Paul's picture. <coughs> The, the central star is actually a tertiary system. Um, uh, the primary star, the primary star, <laughs> is about 11 magnitude. There's a 14.4 magnitude yeah. uh, companion, uh, about uh, three arc seconds away there we from go. the bright star. Can turn the lights down. Okay. Yep. So that's part of the central star of this debate. I've, I've seen debate yeah. in the literature as to which one of those two stars is the actual progenitor star of that nebulosity. And you look at a, a star that's 11th magnitude, that's almost too bright for the, for the uh, ascribed distance to this object of about 1,600 light years. Uh, that, that, cent that central star that you can see right there is actually too bright to be a white dwarf. That's a main sequence star. So I, I believe the white dwarf is, a four that is that 14th magnitude companion. The white dwarf is probably there someplace. It's about three yeah. arc seconds away. This is an old, about a 12th magnitude star. The companion is 14th, so it's a close double star. And I think you're right, the, the white dwarf is probably the central star of the system. This one's the one that's doing the orbiting, so it's a very interesting system. And it was discovered with a 36-inch refractor. Was a, a astronomer was doing some studies of planetary nebula and took some pictures of the 36-inch, and that's how he caught that. So the double star is actually, and I can't think of his name, but the double star is named after him, and it was discovered in 1972. So I don't know if anybody here is going to be able to see that with, a, with the telescope they have scope. in But this, if there was ever an object that, um, needed a filter. It's yeah. this one. Whether it's a UHC or perhaps more preferably a, a, an Oxy-3 filter, you've got the aperture to drive the light through it. Um, I, I've looked at this numerous times and without a filter, it's just four stars sitting there, nothing else. And you put a filter on and there it is. So if you really want to see the value of your filters, your light pollution filters, this is the object you want to go for. It's a nice object. A, and with the 25 inch, Chris and I were able to see some of those dark um, the dark, I'll call them holes, in the, in the object uh, of the clouds. Now this is fairly big. This is larger than the, uh, than the ring nebula, right? Twice as yep. big? Mm -hmm. So you don't want to use a really high power. You probably want something that's medium high, sure. or 80, 90 power maybe? Sure. Uh, this is, uh, down at the top up there is NGC 255. Doug Paul caught that in his picture, which is the larger scale. Next. Okay, I'm going to throw in this. You've got to pardon me for a minute, but I'm a, dub I'm a variable star advocate. And I've given talks on variable stars, and it frustrates me. You know, I don't see a lot of people jumping at this, and I really don't understand why. But uh, another story, I'm an avid angler, and my son uh, had one of these float tubes. You see fly fishermen use, they paddle around the pond. He bought one. He said, it's a flash. You've got to try this thing. And I never would. And he went a year hammering. You've got to try this thing. And finally, he went out in the pond with a little float toy paddling around. And I know a lot of you aren't fishing, but I hooked into a five-pound largemouth bass. That's a prize game fish in fresh water. And that thing took me on a Nantucket sleigh ride. And that thing was tucked me around the pond. I had a ball, so I've been using those since then. So, <laughs> this would be a Nantucket sleigh ride in space. And variable stars are just a blast to look at. I got hooked way back, uh, probably in the mid-1970s, something in Sky and Telescope about, I think it was our triangulum. And I looked it up, had the star hop, and I made observations about once a week, maybe seven, ten days, and you could see the change in brightness, and this really fascinated me. So I joined the AAVSO in 1980. I'll be telling you a little more about that next month because I've got a milestone coming up. But Richard sent something out at the club about this star, Myra. See, if you're looking for NGC 246, it's kind of down in this area, so I'm a little further over off the map here. But you're already out there, and Myra was just recently went to a... Uh, uh, a maximum brightness. The star is amazing. At its brightest, it almost reaches, on some occasions, first magnitude. It's extremely bright. Uh, this time around, it was about 2.5, and as luck would have it, 
Uh, I'm getting back into variable star observing by looking at the astronomical leaks program. And I just happened, since I was out to look for the, uh, for the planetary nebula, I just took, uh, took a look for uh, Myra, and it was already pretty bright, naked eye. So I made an observation. In fact, we'll go to the next slide. I might flip back. And this is the light curve from the AABSO, and the cross-haired ones are the ones I made. Uh, the one, the first one over there, was that's the first night I saw it, it was about midnight, and right away it was about three and a half magnitude. This is kind of neat. And I checked out a few nights later, it jumped up about another half magnitude. So it's on the downswing now. Uh, I had hoped to check it out in the last week or so, but we've had a lot of clouds, so I haven't been able to. Now we'll just go back to the previous slide. And so I'm using <clears throat> alpha, gamma, and delta. Alpha is 25, 2.5. Gamma 3.6, the AVSO calls it 3.5, a tenth of a magnitude is no big deal. And delta is 4.1. So Myra is still up there on fourth magnitude, so I really encourage you, just go outside, it's naked eye, the moon's a bit in the way, don't tell Mario I said that, but once the moon gets out of that part of the sky, it's just an easy thing to see. And what's going to happen, it will start to fade, and I'm gonna work with Upsilon up there, the 4.9, around fifth, magn uh, fifth magnitude. I'm going to keep following that star until it starts to get to where you'll need binoculars. And there's a nice set of comparison stars right in here. So I encourage you, you're going to start out with naked eye. So you don't have to do a lot of work, you just need some type of a chart that has a magnitude and then go from there. And again, I really, if anybody here ever wants to get into variable star observing, check with me. I'd be glad to mentor anybody that wants to get into this because things happen. It's just something that's happening up there that just fascinates me, the way they change brightness. Uh, how many of you are familiar with a star called R Corona Borealis? It's the fade star. I went back and checked because I started to look at that one a couple of months ago, and it's around 6 magnitude, 6.1. So I went every three nights, 6.1, 6.2, 6.1, and then I got 6.4. Wait a minute. Three nights later, 6.7. It had started to fade, and it went down to about ninth magnitude. And it's on the way back up. I looked at it last night. It was around seventh magnitude. So it had a little dip in its back up. This star is amazing. And I went back to 15 years on light curve. I went back 15 years. And up until 2007, from about 2004 to 2007, it was a flat line, sixth magnitude. In 2007, it dropped down to about 14th, from sixth to 14th. And then it went up. There was a little hiccup. It went up to about seventh, back down again. And in recent years, about the past two years, it's been slowly working back up to maximum. And when I started looking at it about two months ago now, it was sixth magnitude again. And then it's had this secondary dip. So this is another fantastic star to look at. The only problem with our Corona Borealis is that constellation is fading rapidly in the west, so we're going to lose it pretty soon. But again, variable stars are just so fascinating because of the changes they go through. I think that's it. Do we have anything else there? We do. Okay, uh, Kelly, you want to take the uh, reins here? No. Rich, you want to take no. the <laughs> Okay. <laughs> so so go this, ahead, Rich. This was hot off the presses from yesterday at Sky and Telescope Magazine. Um, apparently, um, there's an opportunity to see quite a little brief meteor shower next Thursday night. Um, the Alpha, you go ahead and try to pronounce that. Monoceros. The meteors come out of the constellation of Monoceros, the unicorn. Um, just like that little dog on the news today. Um, uh, for, with a very brief maximum of 15 to 45 minutes since around 11.50 p.m. Eastern Standard Time um, with a zenith hourly rate of 400 possible. So, uh, yeah. meteor showers, and, yeah. but, but, well, you won't see it here in the house, so you might as well get a bundle out and get out there and see if you can see something about that and I'll be out there. The moon will be about 20% crescent, so it won't interfere and uh, maybe, it'll, maybe it'll be something cool to see. Anyway. And if you don't know where Monoceros is, and I don't, I have to get a star atlas every time, but just look for Poseidon. Yeah, it's a big empty space and between, then the two, between Orion and, and Poseidon. Exactly, and the two radiants are in this area. These are for previous bursts of uh, activity. So yeah. that should be kind of neat. It'll be on the 21st Thursday night. I'm going to probably start looking about 11 o'clock, just because these things can be iffy sometimes. Uh, the area rises at about 10, so 11 o'clock will still be low in the southeast someplace, but it's worth standing out there for an hour or so and see what happens. If nothing happens, you know, you get some fresh air. 
Okay, thank you, Richard. And thank you for telling me. Thanks, 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 Thanks. I think that's it. Yeah, okay, keep looking up. We'll see you next month. Nope. Well, the only guy I know that can go from catching fish to catching birds. <laughs> We're at a uh, featured speaker, Dr. J.J. Hermes. Uh, his title of his talk is uh, When a Referee Lets You Name Your Star. So I'm really excited about that. He's uh, uh, an astronomer at uh, University of Boston, uh, Boston University. And uh, we're really excited to hear all about what he has to say. So thank you very much for your patience. And we're really excited to hear. It's going to take me a second to hook up. So. Talk amongst yourselves first. <laughs> I'm going to jump in. <laughs> so I, I noticed that you sell the Astronomy of Mysteries of Deep Space wall calendar. The November uh, picture is of your checks uh, that keep getting lost. I want to also mention that I brought in some uh, Australian sky and telescopes uh, there for the down under. You have to turn them like this in order to read them. Uh, we're, we're, offices are moving at the end of January. And we're starting a cleanup. So chances are if, if we don't take, if you don't take these, they're going to end up being recycled at some point. So grab handfuls to distribute to your, you know, friends, neighbors, schools. And Dentist so offices. Dentist offices. <laughs> <laughs> Good idea. Where are you moving to? Uh, we're moving to North Cambridge. We're in North Cambridge. We're just moving to a different spot. All right. Well, hello, everyone. I'm JJ. Hi, JJ. I'm very new to Boston. So uh, just moved up here in January. So I started a faculty job at Boston University across the river. And um, I like to give talks, uh, especially outreach talks, to groups uh, of folks more about the story behind the discovery than the discovery. Uh, and so I will get to the discovery eventually, but I think sometimes it's more fun to talk about the story behind the discovery. And so I want to talk about in the one of the rare instances nowadays when you can actually name something that you discover. So a lot of times in astronomy now, we're discovering uh, new phenomena, new things, but it's rare to actually get to name those things. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about what I think are slung shot survivors of supernovae, which uh, we found just a few years ago, uh, myself and some collaborators in Europe. So that's a slingshot, that's a star. All right. So I work on white dwarf stars, I work on the end stages of stars, planetary systems, and, and pairs of stars, and binary stars. Uh, and so I am an observer. I spend a lot of time with telescopes. Um, nowadays, more and more, that's remote observing. Um, but uh, I, I've worked with groups for the last 15 years. I did my PhD at UT Austin. I did a postdoc in Central England at the University of Warwick. I did another postdoc at the University of North Carolina. And uh, like I said, I've been here for, for a little less than a year now. And so all stars like the sun are going to run out of fuel. They're going to shed all their outer layers. And they're going to end up as just that core uh, remnant, some, it's basically all the, the nuclear byproducts that happen in the, the central furnace of a star like the sun. And so here we are now, about halfway through the sun's main sequence where it's burning hydrogen to helium. And you notice there's this gradual warming where the core starts to lose material and it starts to shrink a little bit and heat up. And so the surface of the sun will get a little bit bigger over time, but eventually it will get really big when it runs out of that hydrogen. And it'll expand out as a giant. And it'll shed all of its outer layers. Uh, that was a really uh, beautiful planetary nebula. That's this, uh, what is it, challenge of the month? Or how, how was it described? Um, and uh, so it's, it, it ionizes and lights up all those outer layers. And then what's left over is just that little core, basically uh, an Earth-sized object. So here's to scale, the sun and the Earth and a typical white dwarf. So Earths have about 60% of the mass of the, the, white dwarfs have about 60% of the mass of the sun packed into a volume the size of the Earth. So a teaspoon of white dwarf weighs more than a car. Uh, these are super dense objects. <coughs> so stop me at any point, by the way, to ask questions or anything like that. Interrupt me. I feel like that's what this is all about, uh, interruption. So white dwarfs are super compact, and you can pack them into very, very tight orbits. And so one of the systems that I've spent a lot of time working on, it was actually found by a collaborator here at Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory. His name's Warren Brown. Um, and uh, it's a pair of stars, it's a pair of white dwarfs. Because they're compact objects, 
you can pack them into really, really tight spaces. Uh, so these two stars orbit each other every 12.75 minutes. So in this meeting so far, they've gone around each other about four times. Um, this is to scale the Earth and the Moon system. Here's Jupiter. Uh, fortunately, Jupiter is not in between us and the Moon. That would be really bad news. Uh, but these are the two stars to scale. Uh, one of them is a pretty low mass white dwarf. It's about a quarter of the mass of the Sun, and the other one is about half the mass of the Sun. So this is like three quarters of the mass of the Sun packed into this really, really tiny volume. Uh, and they're orbiting each other extremely fast. Their orbital velocity is uh, more than 700 kilometers a second. So they're whipping around 700 kilometers every second as they orbit around each other. So they're really, really close together. And what's really special about this, this system, why we've been watching it for really a long time, is these two stars eclipse each other. And you can keep monitoring the eclipse times. And you can see them get closer and closer together due to the emission of gravitational waves. So we found this system in 2011. We've been looking at it since. Uh, and we can actually watch their orbit decay, uh, and they're getting really they're they're getting closer and closer together. In about a million years, they'll actually merge into one freak star. Uh, so the name of this star is really boring. This is how most astronomers name stars nowadays. Uh, it was found in the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. That's what SDSS is. Um, you heard about LSST, which is sort of the successor to to SDSS. Sloan Digital Sky Survey is just making a, a map of the sky down to about 21st magnitude in five different bands, five different colors. Uh, and then here's the phone number. Here's the right ascension. Here's the declination. And that's basically how astronomers name stars. And so I know this star. I don't know, I don't know my own new office phone number, but this is 0651 plus 2844. Uh, that's, that's, uh, I couldn't tell you all the extra numbers, but uh, I can't remember much of anything. All right, so most of the names of stars are really boring nowadays. Uh, if something is found by Kepler, it's Kepler 10b. Kepler 444b, C, Tess uh, uh, 5b, uh, right? So you name after the survey that found it, and then some either number or uh, some some right ascension and declination. So the sky coordinates. Yeah. Uh, what's J stand? So J is the epoch, uh, and so that's the right ascension and declination on the year 2000. And so uh, sometimes you'll see, I think B is 1950. I don't know what 2050 is going to be, but eventually we'll start using a different letter. But that just signifies what what year that that because all stars are moving in time, uh, and so yeah, in 50 years that star will be at a different right ascension and declination. And I've given it to such precision that if you pointed a telescope, even the the really nice sixteen thousand dollar mount, it's not going to hit that that it's going to miss. Yeah. Distance. Uh, this system is about a kiloparsec away. So it's about 19th magnitude and visible. Uh, in V band, and it's, a, it's about a kiloparsec away. So, uh, when we launch space based gravitational wave detectors, we'll see this thing really, really quickly. Uh, in a matter of weeks, we'll be able to detect it. So, I've been trying to work with people to find new systems like this, but um, some collaborators and I actually found a sort of a, a, a second descendant of, of systems like this. Um, so, I just want to take a step back and say, how do we actually find new stars nowadays? And uh, if you Google astronomer uh, cartoon, this is basically what you see. Uh, and I want to just uh, point out a lot of the different uh, things people think about astronomers. Uh, we're all bald white dudes that wear lab coats uh, and have clipboards. Uh, our telescopes don't actually have supports. And they're always out of the dome. They're never in the dome. They're always sticking out of the dome. And, and we're always working with the lights on. And if you think this is an antiquated picture of astronomers, this was in the New Yorker less than three weeks ago, this cartoon. Um, again, like, uh, <laughs> So at least it's night outside, uh, although they're suspiciously bright uh, in that corner. So back 50 years ago, um, astronomers uh, liked to blink plates. They liked to look for uh, changes in, in, in cell motion. And uh, one of the astronomers that was at Lowell Observatory, so this is from a bulletin back in the 70s. His name was Henry Gickless. Uh, Henry Gickless, here's a picture of, of Henry Gickless, by the way. Um, he was a staff astronomer at Lowell at uh, Flagstaff, Arizona. Um, and Henry Gickless just wanted to find white dwarfs. He wanted to find blue things that were nearby. So white dwarfs are intrinsically very faint. 
Uh, so uh, since they're white dwarfs, they tend to be very hot. Um, if you imagine the core of a star, it's extremely hot. So even when you strip out the outer layers, it still has a lot of residual heat. Uh, and so uh, they tend to be blue, they tend to be very hot, and they tend to be very nearby. And so Henry blinked a lot of plates looking for white dwarfs, and he built up this catalog of white dwarf suspects. So here are uh, six random uh, dickless dwarfs, GD suspects. And I'll just highlight one, GD10. So this is the finder chart in 1975 of GD10. So GD means gickless dwarf, and 10 is it's the 10th one in Henry's catalog. And so here is GD10 in 1988, and here is GD10 in 2011. So this is a DSS plate, a digital sky survey uh, plate, and then this is a PanStars image. And it's hard to see from this image, so I'll just blink it back and forth. When I say big plates, Here's a star field, and I put a maroon cross on where the star was in 1988, and here's where the star is in 2011. So all the other background stars are fixed because they're so much further away, and this nearby star is moving. You can see some other stars in the field moving. This is an M dwarf. M dwarfs tend to be faint, so that one's moving. Uh, that's why it's red. Uh, so some of the redder stars, the really red stars, are also really intrinsically faint. Uh, and so. Uh, this was a really good way to find candidate white dwarfs, find candidate close stars. And so I have a lot of friends in the GD catalog because I work on the white dwarfs. Um, perhaps you've heard about Barnard star. Here's E.E. E. Barnard. Uh, this is an image in 1950. Here's Barnard star in 2010. Barnard star is one of the fourth closest stars to the sun. Uh, Barnard star is really close by. So I'll blink that back and forth. You can really see it. Uh, it's moved a lot. Uh, and so. Um, this is Barnard star. It's less than six light years away. Uh, Alpha and Proxima Centauri are like 4.7, 4.8 light years away. So it's one of the closest stars in the sky. So, uh, you know, if you were an astronomer in the 40s, 50s, you could find stars and you could name them after yourself. You could be Barnard star. Uh, we don't get a lot of stars named after ourselves anymore. Um, if you're really into naming things, if you want something to get named after yourself, uh, go find some comets or asteroids. So even uh, amateur astronomers now tend to get a lot of uh, asteroids and comets named after themselves. So this is an image. I don't know if you can see that comet moving uh, right here. This is only like two hours uh, worth of, of images of this comet. Um, does anybody recognize this field, by the way? This is pretty recent. Uh, this is the trajectory, the projected trajectory of that comet. Uh, this is now the second rock that we found that has a trajectory that's definitely unbound to our sun. So it's an interstellar visitor to our solar system. So the director of this fair observatory got into some hot water for claiming that the first rock to pass through our solar system was uh, maybe uh, it had an unexplained orbit, and so it may be some interstellar probe. Um, so I won't uh, make fun on Avi Loeb's sacred ground here and uh, make fun of him further. But why not? I'll do it anyway. Oh, I don't want to hit this thing because it's very finicky. Um, there we go. Uh, yeah, so this is the second object. Uh, so it says 2019 Q4 on here. That object has a name. It's 2I, 2 interstellar, Borisov. That's Borisov. Uh, Borisov is a Crimean, Crimean astronomer. Uh, this is his kit. Uh, I think it's a half meter that he built. Uh, and uh, there's some other telescopes he uses. Uh, he's after finding asteroids, finding comets. And so he's actually found an interstellar comet. Uh, so we've gotten some, uh, I say we, astronomers have followed this thing up, but it's definitely a comet. Uh, and it's, it's almost certainly not from our solar system. So it's an interstellar visitor. So if you want to name things after yourself, uh, find transients, find new objects, uh, asteroids or comets, or uh, big sky booms. Uh, supernovae. Uh, so supernovae are, are often also named after the surveys that find them. Uh, there's a really nice survey called the Assassin Project that uh, was started out of Ohio State, uh, but it's now run out of uh, uh, University of Hawaii and, and Ohio State University, the Ohio State University. So here's a galaxy, and then here's a uh, supernova. This is actually a 1A that I just picked uh, from a few days ago uh, from what is the astronomer's telegram, which is the, the home of transient phenomena in the sky. So if there's something that changes in the sky, it's in the astronomer's telegram. I don't know if any of you all ever visit this website, but it's actually extremely fun to watch discoveries happen in real time. There's so many new surveys. Uh, there's so many new supernovae that are being found. 
uh, they all uh, get put on this astronomer's does that take the place of the IAU circulars, or is it the same idea? Uh, it's a similar idea. I'm not sure if it's taking the place of the IAU circulars or not. Yeah. But the astronomer's telegram is, is probably the most used vehicle, the most used circular now for new transients. It's like an aggregate. So um, even this is not a very exciting name. Uh, Assassin 19, 2019, and then AAK. I guess it's the, what's K letter in the alphabet? Um, 11th letter of the alphabet. Uh, so it's like the 11th uh, supernova in 2019 found in this survey. Um, okay, so we don't tend to, to look up and find new stars. Uh, most of our sky, at this point, there's a huge room full of plates behind you that has, has done a really good job of mapping the sky basically down to 20th magnitude. So astronomers don't find new stars anymore. And so we tend not to be able to name new stars anymore. Uh, but nowadays astronomers really get to name classes of stars or uh, they get to find phenomena that happen in astronomy and then try to find some name for them. And so, uh, all of this is sort of a, a lead into a discovery that I helped uh, some collaborators of mine in Europe and, and at UC Berkeley make uh, a, few, a few years ago. And that's the fastest stars that are escaping the galaxy. <coughs> so this is uh, an image of the Tycho supernova remnant. Um, and the, the nutshell of these stars is that they were in extremely compact binaries. And one of the stars exploded. One of the stars, the mass from that star basically uh, left the system. And so it unbound the system. Uh, so there, was, uh, there were two stars close together. One of the stars effectively disappeared, and the other one got slung shot. Uh, and so we think we've found now, for the first time, at least a half dozen stars that fit this mold. Uh, three of these stars are probably the donors that were donating mass to the star that exploded. Uh, and a few of these look like they were actually the star that itself exploded. Uh, but there's still a little bit of it left over. It didn't fully disrupt itself. But it was still enough mass loss to unbind the system. So that's the systems uh, that I'll, I'll talk about today and, and how we actually came across those systems. So Henry Giklis had this catalog of white dwarf suspects where uh, the poor guy almost went blind blinking plates for decades out at Lowell Observatory looking at small proper motion shifts in stars. And he came up with a catalog of 1,700 candidate white dwarfs. And back a few years ago, every two years, members of the white dwarf community get together, usually in Europe. Um, and I've been going to these meetings now for more than a decade. And it's this great community. It's only 150 or so people that get together every two years. And at the last one of these meetings, uh, I realized there were only 600 of these objects that had actually been classified in the literature. These are all pretty bright. I say pretty bright. They're all 16th or 17th magnitude or brighter which is pretty bright nowadays. Um, so a lot of them had been classified, and I thought it would be really fun to try to follow up the rest of these objects and see what they were. And last year, there was a data release uh, from a satellite launched in 2013 called the Gaia mission. I don't know if any of you are familiar with Gaia. Uh, but it's revolutionizing. It's really putting a lot of uh, astronomers out of business, because uh, it's uh, looking for subtle changes in the positions of stars is now being done by this, this uh, sort of top hat looking spacecraft. Uh, it's, this is an actual image of all, of, of all billion plus stars that it's mapped. So not only is it measuring the positions of about a billion plus stars in our galaxy, in our local neighborhood, it's also measuring the distance to those stars by the parallax to those stars. So it's measured the parallax, it's made a 3D map uh, of more than a billion stars in our neighborhood. So it spins around on its axis and it processes on its axis and it's making this huge sky map. And this is what the entire sky looks like. Uh, it makes this spirograph pattern as it just uh, scans the sky. It's been doing this since 2013. Uh, and so every part of the sky has been visited at least a few dozen times by now. This, this figure was taken from more than three years ago now. And so this mission is making this huge map of the sky. But what that means is that now we can really classify stars not only by their colors, uh, but also by their distances, by their distances, and we measure their 
uh, apparent brightnesses, now we have a measure of the absolute brightness of those stars. So we can distance normalize how bright they are, how intrinsically bright they are. And so stars that are intrinsically brighter uh, go higher up on this axis. And then we can make a color color plot here on the bottom. Bluer stars go this way, redder stars go this way. And so now just with like a few clicks, I can take this catalog that took Henry Gickless uh, several decades of his life to build. And I can try to sort stars, uh, whether they're sun-like stars. This is where su uh, a star like the sun would live on this plot. Here's where white dwarfs live. White dwarfs are intrinsically really small. They're like the size of the Earth. So they're intrinsically quite faint. And they like to live down here on this plot. And so if you look, there's way more stars up here than down here. Uh, so the, the GD catalog had 1,700 candidate white dwarfs. Really only like four or 500 of them are actually white dwarfs. Most of them are just stars like the sun, main sequence stars. It's really hard to do astronomy 50 years ago to try to tease out whether or not it was a white dwarf or not. Um, but if you notice, and I've drawn an error to it, I've tried to draw your attention to the star that kind of lives in between the white dwarfs and sun-like stars. And I've color-coded this plot by their tangential velocity, which is the side-to-side the -side velocity of a star. So you're used to hearing about radial velocities, how stars come forwards and away from you. But stars also have a side-to-side -side motion. And we don't, it's really hard to measure radial velocities for lots of stars, but we can very easily measure the proper motion of the stars. And so that's what goes into this tangential velocity. Uh, so this star's got a really high tangential velocity. It's whipping in the sky. And I prompted uh, an old office mate of mine, Roberto Ratti, to actually get a spectrum of this object from the four meter William Herschel telescope in La Palma. This is a picture of La Palma. La Palma is on the Canary Islands. It's where all the hurricanes come from, off the coast of Africa. Uh, it's probably the second best uh, observatory in the Northern Hemisphere behind Mauna Kea. So this is where the TMT might have to go if, uh, if we can uh, uh, come to some agreement with uh, native Hawaiians about uh, building it on, on Mauna Kea. Um, so there's the four meter William Herschel telescope right here. And it, here in black is the spectrum of this really, really fast moving star that was in the GD catalog. So this red is a model of what this spectrum looks like. And I'm, I've identified here all these different lines in the star. I can't interpret this just by eye. Uh, but I can put it on a plot. Here's what the abundance of those metals are compared to the sun for oxygen, neon, uh, magnesium, aluminum. Uh, the atmosphere of this star is mostly neon. Uh, and then there's tons of oxygen. There's almost no hydrogen or helium in this star. So it has this very, very peculiar composition. The name of the star is GD492. And we were super excited about this. This is really, really strange. Not only does the star have a really, really weird composition, it's moving extremely fast. It's moving so fast that it's leaving the galaxy. So it's moving away from us. We've finally got a measure of its radial velocity. It's moving away from us at like 500 kilometers a second. Uh, here's, the, here's a map of our galaxy. Here's the galactic center. Here's the sun, about 8,000 8, parsec, about 25,000 light years from the center of our galaxy. And then here's this star uh, that's uh, about 8 kiloparsecs from the galactic center, but it's pretty high up out of the plane of our galaxy. And we can reconstruct the trajectory of this fast-moving star. And it didn't come from the center of our galaxy. Sometimes we see stars get kicked out of the galaxy by the supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxy. Uh, the star didn't come from the center of our galaxy. And it's moving so fast that it's leaving the galaxy. So something slung shot it. Something kicked it. So it's got a really peculiar composition. Uh, it's moving so fast that it's leaving our galaxy. It's going to leave the galaxy in, in a few million years. Um, it's moving extremely fast. So when I say it's leaving the galaxy, uh, you know the Earth has an escape velocity. You have to travel on a rocket faster than escape velocity to leave the Earth. Our galaxy has mass, so it has an escape velocity. And this star is moving faster than the escape velocity for our galaxy. So it's gone. So the simplest explanation is that it was a pair of stars. One of them blew up. And this thing went along for the ride. Um, and we think this thing is the thing that actually blew up and a little bit of its leftover. All right, so this was super exciting. So we were really excited to publish GD492. We found this in uh, 2017. 
And then early 2018 comes along, and we got scooped. So this gentleman, Stefan Venn, from the Czech Academy of Sciences, published in the journal Science, uh, an unusual white dwarf, which may be a surviving remnant of a type 1a supernova, subluminous type 1a supernova. So they had the, the track, the fact that the star is leaving the galaxy. It wasn't coming from the center of our galaxy. And we were super bummed out, because this was a really exciting, I mean, it was in science. Like, uh, this is it's probably the hardest journal to get an astronomy publication published in these days. Uh, so we got scoops, which really stinks. Um, what really stunk even further is that they described this star, we report the discovery of a high proper motion, low mass white dwarf, LP40-365, that travels at a velocity greater than the galactic escape velocity. So LP, the name of their star, this was a star in a catalog, it was the Leuton Palomar survey, which was also one of those blinking surveys by a Dutch American, William Luton. And I hope you're noticing a trend with the, uh, the thickness of the glasses of astronomers who blink plates for a living. Uh, so he's the Luton in the LP survey. But it was nice, to, this was basically independent confirmation of what we had thought this star was came out. I mean, it sucked we got scooped, but uh, we were pretty sure that our interpretation of this star was right. So let me, let me like, take a step back and, and totally try, to, try to, to set the stage for the story of what we think is happening. More than half of the stars in our galaxy are actually binary stars. So our sun is, is, a, is an outlier. The joke is that three out of every two stars are in binaries. Um, so you normally have two stars in a binary. The more massive star is going to evolve first, it'll expand, and they'll share an envelope that'll bring those two stars closer together. And that'll leave a white dwarf and another normal star. And eventually that other normal star will evolve into a giant. It'll dump its mass onto the white dwarf. That white dwarf can only get up to about 1.4 times the mass of the sun. That's a Chandra Sekar limit. And then that white dwarf can't support itself anymore, and it'll collapse and explode as a supernova. That companion's gonna be in a really tight orbit. It's gonna have a really high velocity. And when that white dwarf explodes, the companion can then be ejected. So we see supernovae all the time, type 1a supernovae. Uh, this is a type 1a supernova from 1994. This was back in the day when we only detected a few dozen supernova every year. Now we detect a few dozen supernova every week. Um, but this was the fourth supernova from 1994. Uh, and this is a Hubble image of, of a galaxy. I mean, supernova outshine an entire galaxy, right? So they're really dramatic events. This is from a thermonuclear explosion of a white dwarf, all right? So now we're armed with this huge data set from Gaia. We've got this huge map of the sky we know where our friends, I'm going to keep calling it GD492, because I'm stubborn, uh, not LP40-365. Uh, this is where our friend GD492 came from. So it's somewhere in between white dwarfs and main sequence stars, and it's got a really fast motion side to side on the sky, because it got kicked. It was in a really tight binary, and it got kicked, so it's got a really fast motion, got slung shot in the sky. And so we can now look for stars that have colors that sit near this, that have absolute brightnesses, so distance normalized brightnesses that sit near there that are also fast moving. We can go try to look for more of these things. We can try to find a class of objects. And so when I was uh, at the University of North Carolina, this is a grad student that I used to work with, Josh Redding, uh, observing using the four meter SOAR telescope. Uh, this, is, this is what most astronomers on four plus meter telescopes do nowadays. We never go to four meter telescopes or bigger. We have to sit in a windowless, soulless room uh, and look at flickering projectors and monitors uh, to try to make these observations. Uh, usually when I observe, uh, I have the Astros on. Uh, but this is literally what it's like to be uh, an observer on a four meter class telescope or an eight meter class telescope. This is what we do at uh, Lowell Observatory with the Discovery Channel Telescope at Boston University, just to do remote observing. Try to go out when we can, but uh, it's a lot better for the environment, frankly, uh, to not have to go to Chile, which is where the four-meter SOAR telescope is that got the spectra. But in May of 2018, uh, I was observing with SOAR, and I got a spectrum of a star that sat in the, the, the color magnitude diagram very near where our friend GD492 sat, 
And the spectrum looks identical. In fact, if you take GD492, that supernova survivor, and you subtract it from the spectrum we got, you basically have nothing left. There's a little bit of a difference in the magnesium abundance, but otherwise the star is like basically identical. Uh, this star is also moving with such a high velocity, it's leaving the galaxy. So we found another one of these supernova survivors. In fact, we found like two or three more. And I say every two years, white dwarf astronomers get together and hang out. Um, the last white dwarf meeting was in Austin, Texas, which is where I did my PhD. Uh, it's where my cousin lives. Uh, and so all of my white dwarf friends got together. Uh, and uh, one night, we, uh, we were talking about writing up this, this new class of stars. So here's Roberto, the guy who's been leading a lot of these papers. This is a guy, Ken Shen at UC Berkeley, uh, who's found a lot of these really fast moving stars. Uh, this is Stefan Geyer, who's also found a lot of fast moving stars. This is my cousin, he's not an astronomer. Uh, <laughs> he's a great Austin hipster, and he knows exactly where you can have a good dive bar in Austin to shoot pool. Um, and so we all got together, we were talking about what, uh, what we should call this new class of stars. Um, Stefan Ben was not invited, <laughs> the Czech astronomer who, who scooped us. Uh, but at the end of the day, Roberto wrote a paper that, uh, uh, that was finally accepted uh, earlier this year about partly burnt runaway stellar remnants from peculiar thermonuclear supernovae. So this is like a new class of star that we were able to actually tease together. Um, and it has some really, really cool properties. So I'll, I'll try to tie it together here and conclude with some of the really cool properties about these stars. We only know of about four right now, but we're trying to find more. They're all relatively faint. They're all fainter than about 17th magnitude. Um, but the first three members of this class all have very similar compositions. They are literally the most metal-rich stars that have ever been found. There's no hydrogen or helium at all in these stars. Uh, we can have very, very good limits on the, the amount of hydrogen and helium in the atmospheres of these stars. And their atmospheres are dominated by neon. Um, I like to say these are like neon barroom signs that are like flying through the sky. Uh, they're mostly neon. Uh, they have a ton of oxygen, they have uh, a lot of magnesium, uh, and then a bunch of other heavy elements. Um, if you think in spectra, so if you take the wavelengths of the light and the intensity uh, to make a spectrum, uh, they all look kind of similar. This one's a bit hotter than these two. That's why the shape's a little bit different. But their abundances are very similar. So they're super metal, metal rich stars. Um, their abundances have patterns that are very similar to what you expect for a white dwarf, some stellar remnant, that is almost at the Chandrasekhar mass. So the mass, the, the pressures and temperatures at the centers of these stars before they explode get so high that you get a really large production of heavy elements uh, like uh, cobalt, nickel, mag uh, manganese. So this is compared to the sun. Each one of these, this is logarithmic, so this is 10 times more than the sun. For a given element, this is 100 times more than the sun. So they're tens of times more abundant in these heavy elements that get produced in the fires of like a thermonuclear supernova of a white dwarf. And so they have this weird pollution that looks like it came from, from, a, from a white dwarf explosion. So that's super interesting. That's very telling. Do you have an idea of how many of these stars there are? Yeah, so we think we should be able to detect at least 20 down to about 20th magnitude in our galaxy. So they're pretty rare. You heard about uh, our core borealis stars. There are only about 150 of those known in the galaxy. And we don't, so, you know, just because they're rare doesn't mean we can't find them. Uh, so, uh, yeah, they're, they're probably very rare. And what makes them so rare is they leave our galaxy in a few million years. Uh, some of them, some of them, uh, happen to get ejected in certain directions where they uh, can actually uh, stay in our galaxy. And so those are the ones that we'll probably be able to find. Um, but yeah, they, they seem to be pretty rare. Supernova in our galaxy goes off. Uh, white dwarf explodes in our galaxy once every 200 or 300 years. So supernova don't happen all the time. And then if something leaves in a few million years, then, then they're pretty rare. Uh, so the other thing about these things, um, these are white dwarfs. So to become a white dwarf, the star has to evolve, has to burn through all of its hydrogen to helium fuel uh, as a main sequence star. So for our sun, that's going to take 10 billion years. 
Um, our universe is not old enough to have a white dwarf that's below 0.4 times the mass of the sun. And we have mass estimates of these stars. They all range from about 0.2 at most to 0.4 solar masses. So the only way you can form a white dwarf that's that low mass is either if it partially blew itself up or if it was in a binary with another star. Um, so here's an impression of, of one of these really low mass stars. We don't have any evidence that these things are in binaries. So that also helps sort of line some, some line of evidence that these are shards from some supernova explosion. And then these things are moving really, really fast. So this is the ref frame velocity of these stars. Their rest frame velocity is uh, more than 400 times, uh, 400 kilometers a second faster than the sun's velocity. So to, to sort of orient you, this is a top-down view of our galaxy. Here's the sun, like I say, about 25,000 light years away from the center. And all of these supernova remnant uh, sort of uh, survivors, they're all moving in really random directions. They didn't come from the center of our galaxy, and they're all moving at velocities. Some of these things are moving at 2.9 million miles an hour, 5.4 million miles an hour, that's 2,400 kilometers a second. Uh, so these things are millions of miles an hour. Uh, so they're, they're, they're leaving the galaxy. And they did not come from the center of our galaxy. So there's no way to get a star at that high a velocity except for being in a really close binary and having that binary disrupt itself. So they can get that fast if they interact with the black hole, if they get really lucky and interact with the black hole at the center of our galaxy. Um, but they, they didn't come anywhere near there. Uh, here's where they crossed the plane of our galaxy. Uh, and here's our sun, and here's where they're moving. So uh, these are all different you know, future, future casts of where these, these stars are going. And they live in between really compact white dwarfs and normal main sequence stars. So here's three of these, these stars in this class. Uh, and so they have radii that are between about 0.1 and 0.3 uh, times the radius of the sun. So here's sort of like all the properties of these really cool, really weird stars. So for a long time, we were calling these G492 stars. Um, they're extremely metal rich. They have a majority neon. They have all these byproducts from a supernova. Uh, they're really low mass. They have really weird space motions. And some of them are unbound to the galaxy. Some of them are bound, but most of them are unbound. And they have a radius somewhere between a white dwarf and a main sequence star. So, I actually, before this meeting, I started digging through some of the emails that we were going back and forth on what we should name these things. And so last December, uh, pardon my French in this email, but I got really excited on December 13th. This is like, we're writing about this new class of, they're partially bound, burnt remnants of supernovae. It's super exciting. And a few hours later, I was like, we have this unique opportunity to actually name a new class of stars. And so we started brainstorming all these names. We could call them subluminous supernova survivors, or SSS stars, or S3, S cubed stars, or bound remnant survivor stars, or hyper process remnants, or SNA1X. And then uh, Boris, who was uh, Roberto, so Roberto is the lead author. He and I were office mates. This was a grad student of Boris's, and Boris was our old boss at the University of Warwick. It's super great metal, metal head from Germany. Uh, very wise. Uh, he was in Berlin for a few days, and he's like, uh, uh, while we think that a, a subluminous, like a 1A, uh, some sub supernova origin is likely, there are enough unknowns that we don't want to have to corner ourselves. And so I started calling these things hyperprocess stars. I started actually editing the, the manuscripts just for fun. Um, I got caught out. I was like, oh, guilty. I just put that in as a placeholder. Uh, I really like some spectroscopic classification. Um, uh, we had a debate for, for weeks. And eventually, this is the abstract of the paper. So this is like Valero by Ravel. This is one of the bigger letdowns you're going to have in your life. I'm giving you this whole talk about how we got a, a chance to name the class of stars, and our referee did not let us name the class of stars. They're not GD492 stars. They're LP40-365 stars. <laughs> the prototype, LP40-365. So spectroscopy of the four confirmed LP40-365 stars. Um, so in life, uh, you get lemons, you make lemonade. You get referees that are anonymous. Those referees are never going to ever be invited to our pool games ever again <laughs> at, uh, at the White Dwarf workshops, because we're almost certain we know who the referee of our paper was, because the referee wanted us to use the name LP40-365. So 
<laughs> Most new classes of stars get named after the first class of the star. So our core bore was the first dust producing giant star that blocks off light from that star, and that's what the class of those stars are named after. Uh, Myra was the first class of Myra variables, and so they're named after that. LP40-365 was the prototype of this class, and so that's what it's named. And uh, that's what we have to live with as astronomers. 492 rolled off that time a lot easier. Than <laughs> Are you being sarcastic or you're being angry? <laughs> okay, I, I, I believe you. So to conclude, the GD492 stars <laughs> are these crazy weird uh, leftover supernova survivors, many of which are being flung out of the galaxy. And uh, hopefully within the next uh, decade or so, we'll find another dozen. Uh, they're pretty rare. Uh, but it's really cool to think about. We can actually test nuclear nucleosynthesis. We can figure out what elements are in the atmospheres of these stars uh, and try to test uh, what mass they were right when they blew up. Uh, so they, they offer all these, these really, really limitless possibilities uh, to learn about how stars blow up at the end of their lives. Uh, and they were really fun to work on. Uh, and I'm really bummed out that I don't have a better name to share with you all for the class. So thanks. Are there any candidate binaries that are close to potentially uh, acting in this weird way? Yeah, so that's a good question. So if I can get my mouse going. So I don't want to give everyone a seizure by going through this really too fast. All right, there we go. So um, this pair of stars is orbiting every 12.75 minutes. We know of stars. Uh, just a few months ago, there was a, a pair of white dwarfs orbiting every seven minutes. And the velocities in those systems are so fast that if one of those stars had a mass above the ship. So when, when this low mass star eventually starts to dump mass onto the higher mass star, uh, the higher mass star doesn't have enough mass to blow up as a, as a type 1a supernova. It's got to be above about 1.4 times the mass of the sun. Uh, so we don't yet know of any progenitor systems that we know will explode, but they must be out there. So a lot of people are actually looking for those progenitor systems. It's like a really big active area of research to try to find systems that will, will blow up. Uh, but the orbital period needs to be below about 40 minutes for the stars to have a fast enough velocity for them to get kicked with enough velocity to, to be unbound to the galaxy. So they've got to be really close together. But we know of lots of those systems out there. Yeah. So two things. First. You, you surely must have known that uh, GD492 was also designated LP whatever it is. Oh, yeah. Because lots of stars have multiple designations. Sure. Even Giglas identified these because they had high proper motion. Right. So you shouldn't be too unhappy that it ended up with LP. That said, I think you're, I think the referee blew it because you did more than just look at the dynamics of the star. You characterized their spectra and what what it is that's unusual about the star itself, and so I'm with you. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> to be fair, uh, Stefan Venn and, and their, their team that, that had this science paper when we got scooped, they also got a spectrum, and they also, they saw that it didn't have hydrogen or helium, so they knew it was peculiar. It's, if it's a white dwarf, you wouldn't expect it to have hydrogen or helium anyway, right? So, uh, white dwarfs, almost uh, all, if they have any hydrogen at all, if, if less than, uh, 10 to the minus 14 of the mass of the star, that's 0.0000000001% of the star is hydrogen. That hydrogen will float up because all the heavier elements will diffuse down, and so you will see hydrogen. So most white dwarfs actually look like hydrogen. They, all you see is hydrogen on the surface. Yeah. So even though 99.99% of the mass of a white dwarf is carbon and oxygen, because it's the leftover byproducts of nuclear fusion, there's still a little bit of hydrogen that hangs out, because hydrogen's everywhere like it or not. Yeah? Uh, so the, the readers is a bigger than typical white dwarf. Is it because of the low mass or? Exactly. Yeah, so the radius is, t is bigger than a, than a typical white dwarf. Uh, so usually in textbooks, and, and typical 0.6 solar mass white dwarfs, which is what the sun will become, uh, their radius is about the size of the Earth. And lower mass white dwarfs, um, because white dwarfs are held up by quantum mechanical pressure, the less massive it is, the puffier it is. And so these low mass white dwarfs tend to be really puffy. They tend to be more like the size of Neptune rather than the size of Earth. So this is a 0.25 solar mass white dwarf. This is a 0.5 solar mass white dwarf. Uh, and so yeah, they tend to be really puffy. 
Yeah. So on your blinks, um, I know you use different technology now, but can you figure out what what's going to happen to the star eventually? It, will it just burn out eventually? And just so when you say the blinks, like in a blink like this. In other words, yeah, where you're looking at you're you're looking at how fast it's going across the sky. Right. I mean, does this class of star become something? Is there enough information now to figure out what it becomes? Uh, so I, I guess I want to emphasize that most of the time when you see a star blink in the sky, it's because it's really close to us. Okay. So it's a perspective issue. And so the further away a star is, the less it's going to move uh, compared to a star that, uh, from our perspective, sort of tangentially in the sky. And so Bernard star is the perfect example. Uh, it's just a very normal, boring, low mass star. I think it's like 0.14 solar masses or something. It's very low mass. Uh, and so it's, it's quite faint because it's so low mass. Um, but it's moving a ton in the sky. I think it's moving uh, more than an arc second and a half every year. Uh, somebody, somebody, um, maybe somebody in here knows better than I do. Uh, it, it's moving very, very fast. More than an arc second a year, for sure. Um, I think it's 10, 10, 10 arcs second. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. Like it, it's, it's by far the fastest moving star in the sky. Uh, but that's just because it's close. Right. And so what makes these, these supernova survivors so, so strange uh, and so peculiar uh, is the fact that Barnard star, uh, its motion is fast because it's close. Those other stars are actually pretty far away. They're more than a thousand parsecs away. And so their fast motion means that they have actually really fast velocity. And so they're unbound to the galaxy. They're moving so fast. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. 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 So what is the escape velocity? For the solar system? I mean, for the, for the galaxy? Uh, I think it's about 500 kilometers a second. Uh, but the sun, you have to subtract uh, 200 off of that because the sun has a velocity of about 212 kilometers a second. So the rest frame velocity is what matters. So in the rest frame of, of that, and I think it's yeah more than three or 400. I think it's like 400 kilometers a second. Like that. I don't know off the top of my head, but so avoid that. Yeah. So can you walk us through a little bit? How you end up with all this neon? Is, this is a tight one. Yep. So, so you're saying it's it it it's a white dwarf that went supernova but did so incompletely, so that there's something left. Right. So, people are still arguing about this. Um, there are definitely people in the camp that uh, these stars that we see are actually the donors to the star that completely blew itself up. And we're seeing pollution from that explosion onto the donor star. And we're only seeing the atmosphere of the star. So we don't know what the whole star is made out of. We only know what the atmosphere is made out of. And uh, so that's, that's certainly plausible. Um, but if you look at the, the very heaviest elements, those yields, I think, uh, make a little bit more sense that this is uh, basically 15% of a star that completely disrupted itself. And when you get to heavier and heavier fusion, you fuse hydrogen to helium, like a star like the sun, then helium to carbon and oxygen, carbon and oxygen is neon, uh, and then heavier elements like mag uh, magnesium and stuff like that. And so the argument is that for a 1.35 solar mass white dwarf, uh, those have the, that has the temperature and pressure and density to, f to, to run away fusion up to uh, you know, neon and oxygen. You still have a little bit of neon and oxygen left over from that. Yeah, so these are all byproducts from advanced fusion in a very massive progenitor. Uh, something that's like right at the Chandrasekhar limit. That can, can yeah. Uh, so, uh, uh, so you mean this, uh, this uh, super, supernova survivors or uh, LP40-3655 uh, stars are the cores of the donor stars? So, that's one very likely possibility. Um, so I, I, I think you know, this, this, this class of stars has only been in the literature for less than two years. And so uh, there are people at UC Santa Barbara that are uh, in the camp that these are the donors. Um, and then there are people uh, like myself, uh, Ken, at UC Berkeley. Uh, we think these are more likely to be some shard of the, the white dwarf. I have to be careful when I say shard because it sounds like another bad word. but. Uh, some shard of the white dwarf that almost completely blew itself up, but it didn't fully blow itself up. Um, so we actually see 
So one of the special things about Type 1A supernova is they all tend to have the same luminosity. That's how we use them as standard candles to look really deep out into space to sign something about dark energy. But about 10% of Type 1A supernova, of, of hydrogenless supernova, that's what a Type 1A supernova is, there's no hydrogen in the spectrum, about 10% of those are underluminous. So that likely means that they don't fully disrupt themselves. Uh, we call those 1AX, Type 1AX supernova. So we know uh, in space there are likely supernova that leave behind bound remnants, some shard of the star still behind. And there were claims just a year or two ago of actually finding with Hubble the direct bound remnant of a star that didn't fully disrupt itself. So it's not a crazy idea to suspect that the star in some cases doesn't fully blow itself up. Um, that all makes me sound like I know what I'm talking about. Uh, we're still feeling around in the dark. We still don't know for sure what, what, what these things are, but uh, we try to put together as many pieces of the puzzle together as quickly as possible to make ourselves sound smart. We keep getting money from the taxpayers. <laughs> That's our grift. Right, now that I got too real about taxes. <laughs> so, um, analogous processes must occur in more massive stars like that, that wind up being neutron stars mm -hmm. or black mm -hmm. holes. Yeah. So, uh, the nice thing about uh, stars that become neutron stars or black holes is they don't need a friend, they don't need a companion to donate mass for them to explode. They get to do it on their own. Uh, and so, uh, people wonder how much uh, a star that, that by itself blows itself up can actually get a kick. Uh, and we think stars that blow themselves up can get a pretty good kick. Um, I don't know if you remember two years ago, there was uh, what astronomers call a kilonova. Yes. And we detected gravitational waves from the merger of two neutron stars. Um, those stars were nowhere near the center of their host galaxy. They were really far away from their galaxy. And so if you have the merger of two neutron stars, uh, at some point in the life cycle of that binary, there were two supernova explosions. And so uh, people wonder how you can get kicks from those supernova explosions that can actually push stars over, over billions of years far away from their, their galaxy. And so a supernova kicks, supernovas probably do actually get to kick even individual stars, but even the progenitors of these kilonova or pairs of neutron stars. Sorry, I, I may have been too um, direct, like, but it's rare I get to go talk to a group of folks who talk about white dwarfs before I get up. Uh, I was really excited to hear them uh, talk about white dwarfs. That's, that's a good plug for going for dinner. To dinner. Yeah, Right. All right. Well, thanks so much for all your attention. Thank you.